Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Get early access to all of our interviews, including the monthly Chichester chats with writer and comic book legend DG Chichester, new episodes of classic Capes and Lunatics shows, including The Quantum Zone, This That or the Third, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes, or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. Kids, welcome back to another episode of the Chichester Chats. It's me, Phil. Lilith is here, of course. And, of course, the man bringing the light back to modern comics. It is Mr. DG Chichester. Hello, sir. Hello, guys. I, I like that. It's like the uh, hello, kids. Hey, kids, comics. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted one of those spinner racks, you know, like the old, uh, you know, those, those. I know people have some of those. Those always seem fun. I, I want one of those. If you look, I think they're at least over a hundred dollars. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. I think you have to. I mean, to find one in good condition, almost certainly. Uh, I think I've I've seen them a couple of times at uh, uh, like big spread out industrial size flea markets, uh, but they they've been in pretty rough shape. And uh, the amount of time to sand it down, repaint it, um, uh, would be considerable. Yeah, because that's you the other part. Three D print one. Uh three D print one. Three, you could, I could three D print one. You, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's a, <gasps> that's a, that's a just. It would. It's it's a, it's something. <gasps> could put it's a big something. daredevil head or something on the top of it. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Like just staring at you, you know, and then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, because that's the problem. It's like they, I don't think they, they don't make new ones anymore, right? So you'd have to buy a, a used I, one. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, there may be some place making that kind of retro stuff somewhere, you know, just like they make retro pinball machines and retro this and retro that. But I've I haven't looked either, but I'm assuming there's really no market for them in in if they're in a comic store. I think those guys probably had them, you know, from that retro thing. And I don't think there's any there's no such thing as a corner newsstand anymore with where those would really have been so popular. Um so you're you're just going to pick it up that way, or some collector you know is going to want want one. But uh, maybe there's a market. Who knows? Uh, all right, I was going to say, should we jump into the Nick Fury stuff first, or should we talk you, about you, current you events go, first? I, go you you you're. I'm here to like pretend I know what I'm talking about. And you guys, <laughs> you guys, um, which very rarely is the case, and uh, so I'm happy to follow your guys' lead. Uh, I'm only on. Uh, Half a cup of coffee so far. So, um, if better if you if you if you pull me out, however makes sense for you. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> all right. Well, let's do some new stuff first. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, again, we're going to talk about this more next episode. But uh, I did see more announcements on your Kickstarter. Uh, any uh, details you can give yes. us on the Kickstarter? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We've teased this out. You know, if people paid any attention, you know, to it. In little bits and pieces, but uh, finally, I think it's it's time to, you know, stop talking and do. So uh, the book is called Axel's Infernal. So Axel's like a truck and Infernal like hell. And um, it's been something I've been working on for a, a long time. I mean, really, parts of the idea date back, God help me, almost 20 years. But it's uh, um, over the last several years uh, that in fits and starts, it's kind of actually come to life. And it's a... It's a tale of a young woman, Percy Cross, who uh, isn't exactly the most morally upstanding character, as you might imagine, in a book that has hell as its theme. But uh, she gets uh, dragged into uh, working as a, a trucker uh, for hell, essentially. And uh, it had different hells, not just one, you know, hell with a capital H, but every culture, almost every culture, has its form of an underworld. And these underworlds uh, basically ship parts of themselves to Earth in order to promote belief in them. Uh, it's important that people believe in hell as much as anything else. 
uh, for them at least. Uh, so they have a uh, underworld transportation authority that uh, ships these pieces of hell out and they require uh, humans uh, to uh, to do this for them uh, for various reasons, you know, uh, that interoperate. So um, uh, this is the first issue that we're, we're going to be kickstarting and uh, all the pieces are kind of coming together right now. Carl Waller is uh, the co-creator and the artist on it and he's doing really dynamite uh, art and uh, he's got a guy called Wes Wong. Uh, uh, he's just not called Wes Wong. His name is Wes Wong. Uh, you know, who is who is uh, doing the coloring in this really uh, powerful, almost painterly style? We snagged um, uh, Pat Brousseau, uh, oh. Eisner nominated letterer, well well known. Uh, he's doing the lettering, and he's he's having a lot of fun with it. And uh, we hijacked uh, Richard Starkings and Comic Craft, who designed a really, I think, killer logo for us. And um, so I've been putting together a ton of non repetitive. Uh, posts <laughs> and videos and graphics and uh, you know little written things to kind of really uh, hammer this uh, so people will be really sick of me by the time we um, you know get to the end of the the Kickstarter but I think it's really important to get the word out because you really don't know who sees what when you use social media as a as a platform. I mean, I'm excited. I mean, this is uh, going to be, you know, a uh, supernatural horror thing where it's like Manchester original. And for the first time, there's going to be nobody to rein him yeah. in. He's the, it, it, there's, there's going to be nobody to say, oh, tone it down, Dan, tone it down. <laughs> If they told him that on Hellraiser. I really. <laughs> no, Hellraiser, no, 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 nobody, so no me. Anything like that, I'm so down. No. My 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 favorite, you know, quote from Clive, you know, was was in some fanzine thing one time, and it was in reference to a a, a monster that got born because you know uh, the gunfire uh, from somebody else, you know, went through the testicles of somebody else and impregnated, you know, a monster with those shards and and he said yeah you can always count on dan to go the extra mile uh so uh there wasn't a lot of you pulling a quote for your book <laughs> <laughs> but you know oddly enough you know for very this book has and maybe we'll talk more about this uh you know in more detail next month oh yeah and i'll give you guys some background on it so you could really be up to speed and you know, t go down whatever roads you want see where i went there um but uh uh you know, the book is kind of writing itself, oddly enough, and maybe because because it's been saturating in my brain for so long. The characters have really kind of taken me in in directions that are are pacing themselves out. There gets to be some really, I think, hard, horrible moments uh, for Percy and for for other characters as we're kind of introduced to this strange psychedelic experience, uh, you know, that she's uh, she's in. But um but some of it is is very grounded and and not as you know not just going to horrific places right away. Um, I tried to learn from lessons uh, I think of the past where when you dive too deep into too too grisly, too horrific, um, and and say to people, no, no, I like this stuff, you will too, um, without the proper setting up, I think you lose them. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, how it feels, you know, once it kind of comes out and hopefully this first issue, which is what the funding uh, on the Kickstarter is, is for, um, you know, is successful enough that we get to do the other four that make up this first storyline. And then there it's part of a, a bigger world, a bigger uh, set of stories, but really to get this first story uh, line out there um, is, is the most important thing to, to set everything in motion. Can't wait! I can't wait to read again. I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. I mean, I'm gonna pick this up. I, I I can't wait to read this. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's really, you know, uh, I've I've leveraged a lot of friends in the in the uh, industry, uh, um, and sent out some preliminary stuff. You know, trying to get poll quotes and and you know they've gotten back some some. I don't think they're just kind of like yeah yeah nice job Dan you know pat pat me on the head. I think that they're uh, you know, they're giving back some really uh, positive statements. Uh, I got back one the other day, you know, from, um, and I'm not going to give it away totally yet, from uh, Joe Illich, uh, you know, the editor and, and writer. And he was like, 
basically this wasn't what I expected at all. <laughs> and, and that's a good thing, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, he found, you know, some really interesting qualities in it, um, which is, which is what you want. Yeah. Cause I think for the Kickstarter episode and maybe when we talk to Daredevil Black Armor stuff, I think we're going to have to go live. So if people want to tune in and have their, their own questions. Oh, sure. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That'd be fun. Speaking of Daredevil Black Armor, any uh, any updates you can give us on that? That another one I'm very excited for. Um, you know, uh, Netho, you know, and I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Finally, I was doing some other interview and I mangled it badly, and then I said, "Man, I'm talking you up in these interviews. How do you pronounce your name?" <laughs> and he laughed and said, "This is this is the correct one or close enough." Um, but um, uh, you know, he's, he's killing it. I mean, on the artwork, uh, you know, you've seen probably little teases of it. Um, and, uh, but he's just making some phenomenal, uh, choices. I'm so glad when I wrote it initially and, you know, I didn't really, um, uh, I had assumed that what I initially turned in, which was this full plot for all the issues that, um, the editors were going to say, okay, this is good. Turn this into a full script because I, my understanding is that's really where a lot of the writing is these days is more, you know, page one, panel one, here's the dialogue already, panel two, you know, here's the dialogue already, much more like a movie script, but which is fine. I've done it that way as well. That's how I'm doing Axel's Infernal per Carl's choice. Um, but uh, they just sent the plot <laughs> to Netho um, and, uh, and, which is the old way of doing things, if you will. And I'm so glad it worked out that way because he's making a lot of su good, surprising choices. I think his action is amazing. The, the, the armor, you know, the costume Daredevil looks incredible. Um, and, um, and, uh, because he's taking the direction that I put in the, in the plot story, but he's making his own interpretive choices. The stuff that comes back to me is, surprising me you know so while i had lots of bits of dialogue in the in the plot um because now i'm seeing it through his very fresh eyes uh it's you know there's there's different choices that you make you know you're inspired to write something differently or not write something differently you know just as just as importantly oh i don't need to do that um uh there's a scene in the second issue where um um you know, a Daredevil is on a rooftop with another character from the Marvel Universe. And, uh, <laughs> and and initially I thought this was going to be a very kind of practical exchange of information. And that's still in there. But the way he sort of framed it out, I just started laughing to myself. And I thought of this whole um, way to play off Daredevil standing there looking so imposing and grim and Daredevil-ish in his black armor. <laughs> and this other character kind of get, giving him a, a, a bit of ribbing about it, if you will. Um, so uh, I think it's it's cracking along great. He's he's probably about halfway through the, the pencils on the second issue. The first issue is done art wise, done script wise. It's somewhere in coloring and, and lettering. Um, and, uh, you know, he's he's ripping it up with the second issue. Uh, I think people are going to really be blown away by, by what he's doing. And um, I have a, a scheme, even though I get nothing, hopefully I get something out of it in terms of the book doing well. But uh, I was saying to somebody else, you, you know, I'm going to be doing a little social tease of it every day uh, from a month out until the final issue. You know, we've got enough material to kind of like just do a social post a day uh, with some, you know, some of the art, talking it up, getting people to have looks of, you know, here's stuff up to issue one. Now we're on to issue two. Here's stuff, you know, in issue two and kind of hopefully just keep the, the attention um, out there on it. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's feeling feeling really good. I mean, the, the interest is there, especially just like when you put like the uh, figure like on the script and stuff. People are like, where is that the only action figure with that wearing that costume? And, you know, I, I saw that post the other day. It's just like. Oops, give me one second. Okay. Um, uh, technical difficulties. Please stand by. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Uh oh, darn. Please stand by. Well, if I love how cute it is when he was saying about Daredevil and the other character, I'm like, I'm like, just say Spider Man. Nope, I can't hear. I can't hear you. Um, oh, I'm gonna come right back. Okay, I just 
technical difficulties. Give me yes. one second. Um, but yeah, oh, it's well, just a... while he's not here, so I don't embarrass him. It's just great to be living in a Chichester Renaissance, isn't it? I know, <laughs> Lilith. Again, I read I read his stuff in the, <clears throat> in the '90s as a teenager. You know how ex- I, I'm like? I don't think he realizes how excited I am. They like be able to read new Chichester stuff in almost I 30 years. Not just new Chichester, not just but like his independent stuff. New Chichester. His creator own. Yes. I'm so excited. That's what I'm saying. There, you know, he, he has, he's going to have no, you know, nobody telling him what to do on no, Axel's Infernal. But again, new Chichester Daredevil. I'm like, holy shit, you know? Yeah. All right. There he is. Hello. Sorry. That was, uh, that was right in the middle of, you were making some point about, the attention seems to be there, and that's that's a good thing to hear. So, sorry to get caught off there. No worries. No, we we're just saying how excited we are. I'm just again. Yeah, what, what a great what a great time it is to be alive to live in the Chichester Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it you know it's uh, yeah it feels uh, it, it's pretty cool. I mean, you can't tell really. I think what interest there is in anything because obviously you're seeing you're seeing what you're seeing. So it's like when people are like you know sharing. You know, the posts or, you know, Nethos put up some art or I put up, you know, those those little things with the the uh, the action figure. Um, and, um, uh, you know, people respond well. And uh, but hopefully that's, you know, part of the larger thing. I'm going to Galaxy Con in Austin this weekend. Not this weekend. This is the weekend. Next weekend. Labor Day weekend. And, um, you know, I'll have some uh, sample pages. I've got some printouts of the the two alternate covers uh, the mark bagley cover which is oh, the main nice. cover and then Raphael, i can't remember his last name but he's the, the i believe he's the the god of war artist who's done this this uh 3d rendering of the uh of the of daredevil uh in that in that armor uh, which looks incredible and um uh, and also the splash page uh to issue two um which is inked up uh and you know just to try to get more people aware of it because when I was in Terrificon uh, over July, even though the word was out, there were still a lot of people who were like, what, what, what what's this? This is coming oh, out? Grissetti. Grissetti. Yes. Thank you, Lilith. Yes. Grissetti. Yeah. So um, have you that, you guys seen that? that oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm a looks... big God of War fan. So I was just like, oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. I, I think um, I, I would not be surprised if that actually like inspires some people to 3D print out, you know, the cosplay for that. So um, one of the one of the social posts I'm going to put out around that, which is uh, the first person I see in in a in a full in a black armor cosplay uh, will get uh, a free uh, full set of a uh, of fall from grace uh, from uh, from back in the day. You know, so I've got a, a full set of those issues um, in a little like box set. So 319, which was the, a white cover. Um, uh, Empire State Building is not in there. That's the black cover alternate one. But the first person I see at a convention who go, uh, <laughs> your move, Phil, your move. Babe, you need to get a three D printer now. Exactly, get going. You know, but it just looks so great in that in that uh, uh, Gr- Raphael Grissetti uh, rendering uh, because it looks so real, right? All of a sudden, I mean, Mark Bagley's cover looks amazing um, as well, but. Uh, uh, you know, when you see it with that level of 3D detail, it's like, wow, this is this this could be a real outfit. I mean, I think that's a, isn't that one of the big signs that your books uh, get into the big time these days, and when you get variant covers and stuff. So it's is it? Do they do variants for everything? Say, I, like they do for everything. I don't know. I, I mean, it's a Mickey Mouse cover, but yeah. I, I mean, it's fun, but I just get the sense they. I heard heard from some retailers like, oh my god, another variant cover. Not on this, but I mean, just in general, yeah. um, that that's a difficult thing for them to keep up with with everything else going on. I like mean, how much, yeah. and I think that's why they moved to those like incentive covers, kind of basically. Like they have the one A B covers, and then like the incentive covers, one in a hundred, one in this. Mm, right. That's kind of yeah. how they they kind of have appease the uh, retailers what does that mean like when you order if you order a hundred you get one of whatever cover that is yeah they they usually charge like 30 bucks for it right okay so you get the option to it's your bonus for being a if you uh, if you order enough yeah right a retailer driving the numbers up so yeah okay i mean i don't know if that's any better it still means they've got to 
order well, a bunch. You know, that, that one person that wants that beer, they're gonna order it, and you know they they know their volume. At least my guys. Do. I was gonna say, and I, I know, I know, I know at least one retailer. Like he'll like strike a deal with a guy uh, with a store down the street. He'll be like, you know what? Instead of ordering a hundred, I'll order you know order a hundred. You take fifty. I'll take fifty. Yep. I'll, I'll take the cover this time. Next time it rolls around, you get the variant. You know the uh, yep. incentive cover. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But I do, do. Do you think enough readers even go into a store recognizing oh, yeah. that there is a variant? They do, Lilith. Yeah. You yeah. Think I mean, so? people read the solicits like this. It's a really, you know, at least like you know, people my age. We read the solicits. We we plan out our you know our budget for the comics for the month <laughs> and uh, what's going to be on the pull list. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they do advertise on, sure. online. You know, Marvel and everyone else. Just you know, just oh hey, you know these these are the variant covers. So. And then artists are definitely going to push that out too oh, oh yeah, yeah totally totally like, I yeah guess who's got a variant i'm like well you have a variant every month babe what book just tell me what book right <laughs> right 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 which is a tricky road to go down because i mean while they weren't variants you know that was i think part of the doom of you know the 90s you know in the yeah. sense of, of you know then everything became this gimmick right yeah. there's so many gimmick covers Oh, yeah. We talk about that all the time. Well, yeah. I, was, I was gonna say, I think this is the modern version. This is uh, what the uh, holograms and the foil covers have evolved to, where it's just like sure. oh, you, know, you just have multiple covers for issues. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I was, you know, not to go back to the Kickstarter land for a second, but even just planning out that, um, you know, that project of mine and trying to look at comparatives. You know, I was looking at so many comic uh, Kickstarters, and you know, there's. 15 20 variant covers and it's like sir i don't know does that does that make an appeal we're gonna have one variant cover um uh by dean Cotts and uh um but uh but i don't i how do you even keep track of it like, depends on your demographic like maybe if you are trying to like cater to gen like uh z and alpha maybe but like if you're trying to keep it like millennials and a little older like one variant cover at most i i think that like we're all kind of burnt out on variant covers so kind of right depends, right so you have to find that balance right most of them seem to be like not safe for work variant covers like you know here's the soft core that's the beauty of stretch you know goals. i guess you know, <laughs> you know here's the soft core cover here's the hardcore cover i don't well, know i can't talk i'm a red sonya fan so <laughs> yeah you know but I'm actually Even the reading. The main cover's a little soft core on that. C- coming for the coming for the man who impregnated a character with a bullet. That was that was medical. That's medical. That's like you know very clinical. <laughs> it was handled. It was handled with a lot of class. You know. Wait a minute. Did DJ Chester just up my medical doctrine? <laughs> Using all my all my healthcare advertising credibility is coming into play. You know, it's uh. Can we get into Nick Fury? Because I, I have questions about Yeah, him. let's Yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's give I Nick, just, Nick his due. Yeah. It kind of didn't work out to, like, capture that secret invasion uh, audience, but maybe that's for the better. <laughs> something something would have to satisfy the secret invasion audience because I do not personally feel the secret invasion experience was what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, I, I was so excited to play it's Sam Jack. Oh, okay. Is it, got to watch it. <laughs> is it just like in the, the comic uh, event was like it involved the whole Marvel universe and there were so many. It's like, oh, was this person a scroll? Was this person a scroll? And, it, you right. know, and it's like, oh, well, hey, this person didn't die. They, that was a scroll years ago. But it, 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 is it just that the, the scale was so much smaller in the in the show? You're asking my opinion? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, um, I don't I had not read the Secret Invasion comic. So but so. All I wanted out of it was, you know, Nick Fury action, Being a badass. like, like, right. The winter, the winter soldier scene, plus, 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 right. You know, where, where, you know, where he gets attacked in, in his, you know, SUV, and he's clever and ruthless, and you know, and and Samuel Samuel L. Jackson in command, and um, and you know, and a little bit of like the the intrigue of spycraft, right. That was sort of what I took away from the the pitch you know it's a tricky storytelling mechanism when you have hidden characters you know because you quickly run into like unreliable narrators right Mm -hmm. is that is that character telling the truth is that character somebody who could tell the truth but it can be done but and i don't want to like you know say all you had to do was but you know if you watch say um 
uh, what was I going to say? Jack I was Bauer thinking the Americans uh, from FX. I was expecting uh, Americans. Kind of on, yeah. Right. You know, I, I was thinking like Jack Ryan, you know, the, yeah. you know, the, the John Krasinski show on, on Amazon. Like I was totally okay with Samuel L. Jackson showing up different, beat down, tired out for some reason. But at a certain point, you know, he's got to become who we want him to be. Not just for, that's not fan service. That's kind of like the core of the character. And, and it just went all over the place and the choices that were made. I didn't. I don't know that. I didn't feel it was like a smaller story, Phil, because I didn't know the the full yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just felt it was like a badly paced story. You know. I just wanted and, the movie. That's all. I didn't need. I didn't need like a you know a show. I wanted a movie. Yeah, but maybe that and that could have been better, right? Because then they're that, that way they're forced they to they would have have to. down and kill their darlings. You know? Right, right. That would then we it could have easily been a movie. Right. Yeah. Totally. You know, like that could have been right there but i just i mean i know what happens in the last two because you can't avoid it if you expose yourself to the the internet's radiation but i didn't even make it to the last two i you know and i don't think i'll ever go back at this point because it's just like really like when talos died and he left him there on the road i was like that's that's not that's not sorry spoiler alert listeners you can you can edit that and move it's that been a week. I think spoiler spoiler alert. it's been more than a week yeah, yeah no 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 yeah, right. it's been a while so, yeah um but that just seems so out of character you know like that was yeah. this is this is you've had a relationship with this leader of this race for 30 years something you know or whatever and you're and you know and you clearly have a uh, trust or whatever with each other and you, trust, a, the, you a, trusted a, him to be you, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. But but you know the the whole thing was botched, right? You know you sort of you know the, that scene should have played out more in my mind. Like the scrolls, you know, have the edge, and then Fury shows up and really turns the tables, which he does a little bit, but not quite. And then if you had to kill Talos, um, uh, which I'm not sure you had to, but if you did, you don't leave him in the middle of the road. You, you know. I, that's just felt wrong to me so didn't capture me and i mean is the achilles heel of like the big cinematic universe i mean they called it out and i don't know if they ever gave it like a good explanation for it it's a is it's just like oh hey the scrolls threaten the whole planet why aren't you calling avengers in or you know you know all these superhumans yeah or you know but i mean you could have you could have had a good conceit for that yeah right? but i don't think they gave a conceit you know no, they, didn't. they no. gave no conceit they gave nothing you know they wanted to get besides maybe like, ego or something yeah no yeah, right they wanted to get to that end game no not that end game but an end game <laughs> of of uh you know oh look we're gonna do the super scroll fight or something and uh and that was more important than nick fury being nick fury samuel L. jackson being samuel L. jackson and doing some really incredibly clever, ruthless stuff, right? And that's his, that's, you know, if the show is his, um, that should be the shtick. Like his only shtick is in creating the Avengers initiative and then calling in like all these things. He's been the super spy forever. So there could have been reasons set up why we don't want this out there. Why I don't want to involve the Avengers, you know, like what, all I needed was one sort of suspicion, like, you know, like, uh, I'm not sure who is who, so I can't trust the people I trust the most, but I can trust myself and I can trust 30 years of doing this. And, and then, and then, you know, he has to do it himself, like, you know, or, you know, then, or slowly then evolve into who is the other one I can trust, you know, and then that becomes a little mission impossible thing. And Bob's your uncle. That could have been a cool show, but now we, now we pin our hopes on, um, Ahsoka, and that's a different universe. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we still have the comic books. <laughs> yes, you know, you have the character, and like it doesn't, you know, it's you're not doesn't ruin it. You know, it just was sort of like, oh, I thought finally we're going to get, you know, a chance for him to shine, because certainly in the current um, lineup of things, it does not seem very likely you're going to get another Nick Fury specific show. Or one that features Samuel L. Jackson in it. I just thought they were going to use it to maybe even back clean up where it's just like, oh, hey, you know, we can bring back the, any character who died. We can, oh, hey, you didn't like something that happened. No, that was a scroll. That wasn't so and so, you know, just. Sure. But, but that becomes then an ultimate like disappointment, don't you think, a little I bit? Yes. In terms of it. 
I mean, as much as I love Loki and, you know, or, you know, aspects of the Loki show, which, um, you know, which was a lot of fun and that's chemistry, you know, between Owen Wilson and, you know, Tom Hiddleston and, and, and large parts of like suddenly learning about the TVA and, and all that. But when you saw that drawer full of, of infinity stones, you, you know, as funny as a bit it is, and it is, it's a very funny bit. It does kind of like undercut the importance of the infinity stones and the importance of that thing, you, you know, so funny choice. This is a great gag. The audience will laugh with us. Um, that choice was made, but that supplants, well, all the, all the investment I put in this other stuff and all the investment I put in Black Widow dying, and, you know, and, and anything else, does anything matter? I mean, is that just like a clumsy attempt at them trying to up the ante every time where it's like, oh, the Infinity Stones are powerful, but the TVA just keeps them in a drawer. So they must be how, you know, how powerful or, you know. Maybe, maybe, but but you have to then really connect with the audience in the right way that you're upping the ante truly matters. Mm -hmm. You know, Quantumania, you know, again, my opinion, a um, lot of things to enjoy in it. You know, I thought there's some really good stuff and all the performances and, and so forth. But if you're trying to set up Kang as this new next level big bad, right? Okay, and a lot of the movie does that, right? Jonathan mm -hmm. Majors, whatever his, not whatever his issues are, if he has issues, then they need to be addressed. But just as a performer, very powerful performer. Um, but Kang gets defeated by a race of super science evolved ants, right? We don't even need the Avengers. We don't even actually need Ant-Man, right? You know, we need, we got, we got Michael Douglas showing up with, so the, the big bad, no matter how many times you repeat him or bring him back in various other alterations, you, you it's made a, ants. you big, a big stake in the ground, right? Yeah. He got, he got trounced by a bunch of ants. So now you're having to kind of up your ante on your upped ante. Oh, well, that Kang wasn't that, that strong, but this Kang, you know, he's, he's the real deal. You know, we gotta opposed, we're going to bring the full picnic this time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I bring the raid with me this time, you know. Um, so, you know, yeah, you do get into that, that if you go down that road, you have to continuously up your ante. But in that instance, it was like, what did you just do? Like, I'm not sure, you know, like maybe if he had escaped at the end or quote unquote learned from something that he had done, you know, maybe if, you know, your after credit scene would have been that Kang showing up in the council of kangs or whatever they're called and then uh i have something to tell you all you know like he's suddenly going to share like what he learned so that they all become more powerful because of that you know experience whatever i'm not you know but um did you ever get caught in that up in the ante loop with just actually writing nick fury i mean we're bringing like these issues that we're going to talk oh about today, yeah like red Skull, like, Red Hydra. Like, yeah nice, I'm gonna nicely it. done nicely done i see what you did there yeah um, yeah Twenty two, twenty three is what we're talking today where uh yeah so you brought back uh baron strucker yes yeah, that was i mean that was actually um that was upping the ante right strucker was was meant to be you know, a big bad and an unexpected big bad and, and behind the scenes, something Fury wasn't going to know about. Um, and that was, that was going to take me through a lot of stuff. And it did take me through a lot of stuff. And if I had been better behaved, it would have taken me through more stuff. But, um, but that wasn't, you know, there was so much I could do with him. I thought once I reestablished his, his mandate and his drive and his, his cleanup on Hydra, Right, because I brought this character back to then have this sort of new supremacist or evolved supremacist attitude, um, and and him looking at what Hydra had become and saying, "You're all a bunch of fools. You know, you've ruined my, you know, my my dream, my organization." So he gets the clean house. He gets to bring in some fresh, you know, new evil blood, and then that was a platform I felt you could continuously up the ante on. You can continuously in, 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 in a consistent way because pockets of what he was creating always laddered up to him, right? So he was, he could be the central figure or he could be a figure that, um, lieutenants or factions 
now newly loyal to him and his vision uh, could give us um, different ways in, either big action ways or ways that were more uh, intrigue. Um, as long as you kept mixing it up and it wasn't just guys in those weird little smock suits, um, you know, which we were continuously trying to kind of police other um, other Marvel offices, other editorial offices, because, you know, we were trying to say Hydra's this now. And I had a couple of compatriots like like Greg Wright, you know, who would who would say, yes, this is the Hydra that we're trying to create. And this is how Hydra should act. But then Hydra would show up in other books just because eh, I need a bunch of bodies to knock over. Hey, let's get some smocks in here. And then it would be just a bunch of, you know, can dumb fodder. characters. Yeah. yeah, you know, they're can of fodder. They just run in, they get mowed down. Um, aren't you a stormtrooper? No, I'm a Hydra agent. And uh, and so that um, that was a little problematic. It almost felt like you were kind of like working in a pocket universe. <laughs> you know? But it was but it was fun. I mean, yeah, I, it, it does up the ante, but it's like, is Baron Strucker like Fury's like opposite? You know, like you have your like your Batman and Joker, and it's just is is Strucker the, the guy, the the arch enemy of Nick Fury? I, I mean, to me, he always was, and I mean, when I brought him back from the dead, literally, you know, uh, literally, whatever that means in comics, uh, you know, but the character had been dead. There had been clones or robots or LMDs or. Um, uh, you, you know, type things, but the character was dead, you know, at the bottom of the sea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I was uh, maybe good at in a couple of, of places was, you know, reading the history and finding one little element of things. I was like, what, what about that? What if you could do something with that? You know, it was like with Last Rites, you know, the Fall of the Kingpin story, it was, you know, Frank Miller had, you know, written that one line, you know, about like, oh, the Kingpin's hidden the, the, the bloody billy club somewhere. You know, yeah. and 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 that wasn't the whole hook of the story, but it was like, oh, well, let's let's have him think those are important, you know, in some way, and let's play with those a little bit. And there were aspects of this, you know, of, of Strucker being killed and Hydra Island sinking and the Death Head uh, virus, uh, Death Spore virus, rather, you know, being, um, you know, in the air and and everything uh, in that in this now uh, uh, blighted, you know sunken uh, kingdom uh, that sort of added up in my head and said, well, what if we, we could use that? You know, if we could use the power of a virus to, to uh, revitalize it, maybe it was like a proto fall from grace. I seem to like viruses. Right. And, um, uh, but you know, he was a classic villain. And to me, it was like, I like that. I like that feeling of a classic, you know, I am, you know, Wolfgang von Straka, um without having to go full Nazi. Right. You know, definitely Nazi, I'm not even going to say Nazi light, but, you know, he's not wearing the insignia like the skull or something like that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it just triggered this way to kind of have this guy come back in his organization and say, man, you guys have let this thing go to sea. Isn't that going to be fun? And then I don't know that he's not, you know, he's not an opposite of, of Fury. You know, Fury has a lot of dark, or at least that Fury had a lot of dark. Mm -hmm. qualities to him right he, he had been ruthless he had been cruel spycraft requ required doing very underhanded things over the years um and so uh but they're done for the right reasons right quote unquote um and i think that um he's he was a powerful character nick fury could be a powerful character he was everywhere he could do anything he could manipulate things he had secret information on so many people so a character like Strucker um, and that history between them, you know, just felt like something that would be good to give him a foil because there wasn't one in the book when I took it on full time. Right. You know, I had done that storyline earlier, but that was a fill in, if you will. You know, I, I knew I was on it. I knew that story would run, but I wasn't going to be able to affect the whole course of the book. But now that I was on it, you know, let's give him something that he could he could focus on, even though he wouldn't know it was Strucker for a while. Uh, I, that's interesting. You were, when you said about, uh, you know, he wasn't like, wasn't like the full Nazi, he's not wearing the symbol and stuff. Like, it's like Grunewald did that with uh, the skull in the nineties. Like he started wearing like the art, you know, like the Armani suits and stuff. Right. And I don't want to like downplay like Nazism and stuff. Cause, but it's just like, 
is it just like such a one note one trick pony thing where it's just like hey i hate everyone who's not like me and it's it's just well, the nazi aspect yeah yeah it? It, it, i mean just for like you're like when you're writing fiction where it's just like yeah well how do you do this month in and month out it's just you know is well, it just you a, could you could I mean, God help us, you know, look at the world around us today. Yeah. You know, but, people full on embracing Nazis. I'm not saying it's realistic, but it's just. No, like, no, no. It, but I mean, look at them. Look at look at yeah. the people who are doing it in the real world today. They see themselves as very multifaceted people. Right. You know, um, and this is a core aspect. I mean, this is a horrible thing. We're going to step away from this road, you know, quickly. But if you write a character like that, you know, there is a whole host of awfulness to that supremacy fascist mindset, which you can pick and choose from, right? You can go down the racist aspects. And I used the skull a couple of times and I did that. Like I went right into, you know, to make that, you know, uh, like one is not better better than the other, right? But when I played with both of them, right? I played more to the skulls being just, you know, you know, only I stand alone, only my people, only my, you know, things are here. Um, and I played Strucker, you know, more in this supremacist way, like, like apex predator, you know, sort of thing. Like if you, you know, the superior, stronger character, you know, is the, is the one who defines success. So if you can meet me at this level, I don't care where you come from so much. You know, that was almost like the charge with the new Hydra right? Play at this level, right? Show me you are strength and cruelty and, you know, and subjugation. And I will allow you into my fold. But, you know, you br- you break that once and you, you know, you're crushed like the rest of the insects. And, and so that gave me ways to focus in on the characters that was not just, you know, um, I am a Nazi, right? You know, and, and that's, I, I'm not embracing them. Like neither of those characters oh, yeah, no. are, you know, kind of like. I mean, some villains you sort of you slip the skin on, and you're kind of like, yeah, it's, it's it's fun, you know, like whatever. But neither are fun. But I could get in their in their heads and unpack it more than just simply saying, you know, it's like a comedian getting up on stage, right? You know, and you know, and the first words like are like, you know, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm playing in Denver. Hey, you know. Yeah, hey Denver, who's from Denver? You know, like saying this, you know, like looking for like cheap applause, right? Yeah. The, you know, my yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so he likes, you know, like just just playing up the, you know, oh, I'm a villain, I'm a Nazi, um, thinking that that's going to solve your your problems or set yourself up. Um, it's a quick, cheap, cheap way in, but you got to do more with it. Oh yeah, because I mean, you, I mean, you want to be able to like even if you just read the dialogue to be able to tell the difference between the uh, structure oh, yeah. and the skull and then right. just like, wait, who said that? Cause they both sound the same. Yeah. You don't want exactly. them to sound the same. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You have to, you have to do that. Um, and there's a scene in this, I, I believe, yeah, I think it's in this, th- these issues, maybe just after, but um, you know, where they get together after Strucker has been resurrected, you know, and, uh, and, um, and, you know, there, I remember, and I can read it now, you know, and I, there's a, there's a quality between them. I think there's even a distaste on on Strucker's part, you know, for the skull in a sense that, well, you've been defeated so many times, you know, you you are not you. Wh- wh- where's your superiority? Where's your strength? You know, you know, we've known each other for ever, but I don't even know if you match my needs at this point. Oh yeah, I, I always enjoy that. Yeah, where they're just like bicker among themselves, and right, and, right, and, right, and, right. and it's like Strucker. You know, he puts his money where his mouth is because he treats his kids the same way. He's like, show me you you are a you know a worthy yeah. heir to yeah this right. throne. Yeah, right. Otherwise, I'll just clone myself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a but credible only, foundation. It's a credible threat right. in the Marvel universe. Right, but there's only one monocle. You know, so it's like you know you have to like you know that's how you tell the difference. Like. <laughs> I'm surprised that wasn't uh, some kind of secret weapon. Yeah, that that's maybe it's, it's the monocle to the eye patch, you know. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But uh, yeah, and, and uh, so yeah, Strucker raises your th- the threat and stuff. But like, is that like a um, like a cornerstone of like writing a monthly comic, whether it's like a solo character or like a team? It's like you have to build out that rogues gallery, like 
and again, if you're a successful writer, you know you, you bring back some of the hits, but you also create some of your own. Sure, yeah, sure, and and uh, that's exactly right. And and I think the you know the hits are there. You know they have a history. Also, as we've talked about before, you know, the big James Bond fans. So, um, you know James Bond had Ernst Blofeld, you know of Spectre, right? You know who you know was his foil across many stories. So in some ways, I looked at. At um at the uh, at Strucker, you know, as a, a Blofeld like character, and sometimes too much. You know, I think one of the, the speech he gives after he he blows up uh um you know Shield uh, Central, you know, and and kills all the agents, you know, and there's a hologram, and we don't know it's Strucker yet, but it's kind of like Hydra's back, you know, you know. I think he actually says, you know, we are, you know, we are special executive for, you know, you know. You know, counterterrorism, revenge, and extortion, which is what Spectre stood for. So, you know, I was just playing my in jokes um, out. But, but I did try to, and they were intriguing characters. But I don't think I, I played with them enough in the right way. But I did start to kind of establish like a, a set of sub lieutenants for for um, for Strucker. You know, there was a, a Garrot. You know, who was like this weird bald assassin guy with these long fingers he would like use to strangle people and there was uh you know a, a couple of uh, uh, uh other characters of that ilk you know who um who started to function in that way um and the thinking would have been to continue to do that so now you're introducing new new villains um who are part of the main right but you don't always have to have strucker right that's that's kind of where you went or even when you went over to to um you know, skip over to Daredevil, you know, for a minute, right? The tree of knowledge story was, mm. you know, Strucker was pulling the strings behind that. He was testing New York. Can New York rise to the occasion? Who is weak? Who is strong among this? I'm going to, I'm going to dominate this city and, Good and, luck. and create panic. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, that whole system crash, uh, grouping, uh, was, uh, you know, was a sub team of his. Oh yeah, because uh, you know, as you were saying that, I even um, yeah, I mean, you were making Hydra a credible threat because even like as early on as Fall of the Kingpin, weren't they trying to get the Kingpin in their pocket? Be like, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you yeah, don't want them yeah, be like, you sure. work for us now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oddly enough, Strucker has uh, more history with Daredevil than Daredevil probably knows. You know, <laughs> yeah, because that's uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite lines. You know, I think um, you know, I ever wrote was uh, when. Um, and then I think it was that Garrock character who, who actually said it, you know, at one point he sort of reveals that Hydra has been, you know, been manipulating Fisk to a certain extent and mm -hmm. Daredevil's actions had taken Fisk's attention away, you know, enough that he didn't really realize what was happening. Um, uh, so they weren't working together, but, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing behind the scenes. Um, but, you know, he says to Fisk as they're blowing up his you know, his things across town, his warehouses and all this, you know, you know, you're only a criminal, Mr. Fisk, and we, we are conquerors, you know, which is just how I felt about like that level, like Fisk is this powerful criminal force. But when you what's the next level up from that, right? That's like just an organization that just looks at things at a, at a whole different scale. And I mean, I remember Fall of the Kingpin. I mean, that was Nick Fury playing chess too, wasn't it? Where it's like, it's like, basically like, don't look at our computers, you know, because Nick Fury is basically like giving him information to take down the Kingpin. Right. It's like, you know what? Right. It, you know what? If he can uh, mess up stuff for Strucker too, you know, well, that's, that's a win for me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's playing everybody in that story. And then the, 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 the thing that he just gets out of control is I don't think you know, there's a, Fury says at one point after Daredevil says, like I've got this or I'm going to do this my way. You know, he says like fire in the hole, right. Which is kind of like the whole sense that it's like an explosion's coming. So yes, Fury's playing chess or trying to kind of manipulate him there and not just saying, here's the information, let him What's think he's going to, yeah, exactly. And then, but, but, but things get out of, out of hand, you know, as it were, uh, maybe, maybe Fury wanted something to happen, but didn't want it to happen to that, you know, that end. So it was. I uh, I figured it, I figured it was plausible deniability. You know the old Jim Gordon excuse. I don't know. I didn't. He's a man in a mask. I don't know what he was gonna do. It's... Yeah, yeah. Some 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 of that. But um, I actually took a. I think I took a beating. Uh, it's it's around here somewhere. There's a great uh, book. Um, um, I think it's called Being Matt Murdock. Have you guys seen this book? 
and it's um uh, this woman um who wrote it uh it's all like she actually went through like the science of the hypersenses and it kind of like talks about how certain things could work or might work it's a really good book and um uh, but anyway she she knocks me around a bit in there for that that scene like reading reading off a screen <laughs> You know, with the fingertips, you know, like as if the phosphors would have the shape of letters and stuff like that. So um, I told her, I told her there's none of that in a, in Black Armor. <laughs> we might have to put that on the book club list, though. I, I already wrote, I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Uh, but no, that's, a, well, that's what Lilith and I were saying. It seems like they've kind of gotten away even from like him being able to read like regular print with his fingertips. Because I don't remember the last time they've ever even mentioned that. It's all oh. audiobooks now, babe. It's 20 Braille and audiobooks. <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, yeah. There's there could be that, but um, um, voice to text. Yeah. Y- you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, do they? Uh, I guess if you, there might be a, a sense of that, right? There's so many accessibility things, right? If you need to read something off a screen, there would be an accessibility setting, right? He, he could have it played back to him, and he would know how to how to access that, or um, but you know, print material. I, I don't know. Maybe they're just, that doesn't factor into certain people's stories. Oh God. Are, they, are the comics even say, is dead. Say is the, that's pretty it's, sad if the comics are saying that. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, what does he have to read? He just, he just has Marvel Unlimited. What does he need uh, to read anything off the, off the page for? But, um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, do people play with the senses as, as much? I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I know we're, we're, you know, we're circling around on different. Oh topics. no. I mean, uh, this but, is the um, Chichester chats. I want the thoughts of DG Chichester. Come on. The, um, but, you know, I mean, I'm having a lot of fun playing with getting back to playing with the senses. That's one of the things I always really liked. Oh, yeah. And that's, you know, again, credit to Netho for the choices he's making in the, the storytelling in this Black Armor story. Like some things are just a, not, I don't want to overwrite. I want to make those old sins. But, you know, there's just some moments where like, wow, I can, he's got the storytelling so clear here. You know, I could just make it about the little fragments that Matt is or Daredevil is sensing in the moment. Like, what is he feel? You know, what is he feeling or smelling or you know, tasting or, or you know, or anything, which is an important part. There's a scene I'm, we're doing right now, um, or he's he's gotten to, and now I've got to break it out, where his senses are going to get so overwhelmed in this moment that he's only going to be able to depend on the the radar sense, and some things are going to be happening that are like he can't interpret right if that is just a a base level like impressions right i'm not using it like oh i can precisely know the shape of phil's glasses and the shape of his head you know a a kind of just larger groupings of 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 space and elements um when weird things happen you can't know with precision what's going on so he's got to sort of trust his instincts and take a risk, you know, at certain things to kind of follow up in the scene, which is a lot of fun to do. And that's why he's a daredevil. Exactly. <laughs> hey, there you go. Oh, I do want to say that I absolutely love the covers for this. They really pull you into story. Like it's very, it gives you a very retro feel. Yeah, the they they did a, a, you know, all credit to editorial and and you know and and. Uh, I mean, they got what we were, you know, we wanted to do. Everybody was in sync. The covers feel great. Butch. You can definitely Jack- tell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Butch Geis, I've said this before, you know, Jackson Geis, who was the, the artist, um, you know, he was sort of like, I never knew exactly what he was going to do. Right. You know, because he didn't, he followed the, the general plot, but he was doing a little bit of Steranko, a little bit of himself, a little bit of movie poster stuff. Yes. So sometimes you get these beauty shots or or choices, you know, that were just like when Strucker shows up and he's he's just not wearing a shirt. He's just like striding around in like these, you know, these, you know, these these cut off pants and like, look, look at me. I'm so like, you know, glorious. <laughs> uh, you know, that was part of like because I didn't write it that way. I wrote it like, you know, Strucker shows up in a new uniform and, you know, and, and stuff. And instead he's got him just like, you know looking like Willem Dafoe in Streets of Fire, like just look, look, look how, yes! how glorious I am. I mean, that just inspires you to write things in a different way. And, um, but I think all that particular set of issues you picked out um, felt so much like all cylinders were kind of firing, you know, in terms of 
you know, we knew what we want. I knew what I wanted to do. Um, you know, setting up the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the hydra surrogates who go and sacrifice themselves to bring the island, you know, to, to reactivate the virus, you know, in the sunken island to, to resurrect, you know, Strucker. Strucker starting to set things up with the skull and his old confederates. And, and, uh, you know, um, I guess, I guess I had to be careful. I didn't just, you know, make it, you know, Wolfgang von Strucker, agent of Hydra, you know, I, you know, make sure Fury was still in the story because I was having a lot of fun with Strucker. But, um, but I knew that was in service, you know, to the, the hero of the book, right? It's, it's an obvious thing. Heroes are only ever as strong as their villains, right? You give somebody a, a weak, weak villain and, uh, and, you know, what, what do you, what do you got? You don't got much. Um, that's, but, that's also the beauty of the setup for the story. Like, I didn't mind this. I was like, oh, yeah, we should probably get to Nick. Nah, none of that. <laughs> it was really interesting getting getting to that point where we're going to see where Nick slots in. So right, like, right. And that, that, that's a good, that's a good, that's the sign of a good writer where the setup, you're just like, oh, the exposition isn't hitting me in the head like an anvil. That, that's nice. That's yeah, nice. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, could I have handled that with, with three panels? Like, you know, he shows up and it's like, where did you, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, right. It's like somehow Pal- been gone for so long too. I think it justified it. Personally. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I mean, you, you know, we all cringe at the somehow Palpatine returned, you know, moments. <laughs> right? it's, it's kind of, but you also thank God for them because you get to mock them, you know. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I've read enough Chichester. Did nothing yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's at Little Hellfire. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I've read enough Chichester. I'm like, oh, yeah, something simmered on the stove. I, he, you know, Dan's cooking something up. And just <laughs> even though I know kind of, you know, what's coming, especially in that Daredevil stuff. And no, I mean, like Lil said, every every step was justified. And again, it's not like Strucker died five minutes ago and you brought him back. He'd been gone for a while. So, yeah. And, and why hadn't, you know, people brought him back? And, I, you know, there was a little bit of a political play there, too. Not mm. full up. But I will, I mean, I like Strucker. I thought Strucker would be a good thing to play with. But I was also being a little, um, like, people within the Marvel editorial group who were big fans of, of um, you know, classic characters and classic situations and stuff like that. And I'm thinking specifically of Ralph Macchio, you know, who would be my editor on Daredevil. And I knew Ralph liked my stuff, you know, from what he'd read on on some other things, but this was before I was on Daredevil, remember. Um, y- you know, I kind of thought to myself, you know what, if I bring back some classic characters and do justice to them, it will get me some cred with people in editorial, right? It'll, it'll like make them look at what I'm doing and, and think more favorably of me and what I might do on their books as well. So, you know, in that instance, I knew Ralph was a fan of Fury I knew Ralph was a fan of Strucker. And so, you know, that wasn't the only reason to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to play him just to Ralph Macchio, but you know, Ralph was influential. Ralph was well positioned. Um, and, uh, and that could, you could do worse than do right by, by Ralph. So that was you know, part of like, Oh, let's see what I can do here. And I think that that's, that's also part of why he gave me, you know, the option to, to pitch Daredevil. Hmm. I mean, I mean, it, I mean, it works. I mean, put it aside. Oh, it's their favorite character. You know, it's so and so's favorite character. I mean, it, it's you tell a good story. It's going to speak to everyone. You know, the editors, sure. the audience. Sure. Uh, and and sure. again, they're going to sit up and take notice if they're like, oh, hey, you know, everybody reading this book seems to like what Dan's doing over there. Yeah, let's uh, let's throw him some more bones. Yeah. But you have to, you know, you are playing your audience a little bit in the sense that, you know, a lot of the. Um, the work I did at Epic, right? The, the shadow line books, you know, which is a set of three books, Dr. George and Dr. George, St. George, <laughs> Dr. Zero and, um, and power line. Well, I'll tell you a funny Dr. Zero story, but, um, more recently, but, um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think those, those books were a little rocky at the start as Margaret Clark, who I was writing with and myself kind of got our groove on and, and learned about these new characters, in this new universe, but, you know, by the issue two and kind of on, I think there's a lot of really great storytelling in those in those issues. And that's a big story, right? We did like eight, nine issues of the, the regular books. And then we did this big critical mass story that, you know, wrapped it all up. But it was a huge mega series. Um, 
But nobody in regular Marvel probably looked at those books. So huh. that good storytelling there didn't matter until I did a good story with a Baron Von Strucker. <laughs> you know, so so it's like well, I used to recommend to up and coming artists or writers, you know, and I'd meet them at conventions and and they would be like, you know, oh, I really want to work at, you know, on the on the Hulk or something like that. You know, you're starting out, you might not jump right in there. But if you do want to work on the Hulk, right, and you're showing me all your Thor pages or all your Spider-Man pages, and these are pretty good, but you know what the Hulk editor is going to look at? Hulk pages, mm -hmm. right? They're going to, they should be able to interpret anything, but by and large, the editor of a certain character is going to respond better Ooh, if you one. go in and pitch, not, not necessarily to pitch, I should be your new Hulk artist, but, you know, show them something that they're already aligned with and, you know, take, take the weekend, take a couple weeks, do some Hulk samples. And, you know, that's going to make whoever's editing Hulk, like nod their head better. To like so kind of associate you with that character, be like, oh yeah, so I saw I saw him. Uh, yeah, he fed me some Hulk pages. Yeah, he might yeah, be good for this Hulk, you know. the new Hulk book. Yeah, right. Or or just you know just to be able to appreciate your abilities better. You know, when somebody spends all their day, every week of you know um, every week, uh, every day, you know, evaluating Hulk stories from the professionals who are doing it, right? They're in the zone. Right. This is the way the Hulk moves. This is the way. It'd be more exciting. This is the way so-and-so speaks. So they look at your stuff and it's a Spider-Man story. You're kind of one step removed from what they know, but you put them in the Hulk groove. Even if they're not going to hire you for the Hulk, they could say right away, wow, you really know how to tell a good story. You know what? I'm going to recommend you to so-and-so, hmm. right? I know he or she is looking for something and I can tell right away you've got that going on because you know, you're in, you're in the realm of my, um, my understanding and my best knowledge. Okay. I just want to bring up one last thing before you, we let you go. See, I thought that they maybe came to you to ask you to ask to bring back, you know, Strucker, Strucker because it is, we're in that 50 years of Captain America. So like I thought, or maybe that was just the timing and everything just came together. Yeah, it was the timing. I, I think, you know, once I got the assignment to do the book itself, um, you know, coming off the, the short run I'd done and the, the gap of a few issues and then kind of, you know, you're the writer. Um, uh, it was it was probably in my head, you know, hoping that that would happen and like knowing I'd want to do a big bad instructor was in my mind for all the reasons we've talked about. Um, but I think I led that that charge and figured out the conceit. There was there was no, um, you know, I was generally spared a lot of edicts and things you know you have to do this or you have to align with that uh, for most of the part of the things i kind of worked on so it was my choice to 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 do it and you know happy it played out that way i mean the, i mean especially well especially at that point where there are a lot of preconceived notions of nick fury from people or are they just like yeah as long as you don't go like too far off the reservation you can pretty much you know do what you want with this character yeah i mean yeah and and any there was, I think that was exactly right. Preconceived notions. And, you know, it's the sort of thing, just like the Hydra characters, if he showed up in another book and somebody wasn't policing it, they were going to do whatever they wanted, which was unfortunate. You know, it'd be nicer if there was a stricter policing on some of these characters to sort of say, no, if you're going to use it, you've got to be consistent with what we're doing because we're trying to build something that's good for the entire, you know, Marvel universe. Um, but, um, you know, we've talked before about how I use this as my, my chance to write a James Bond movie, <laughs> you know, and, and play out some Tom Clancy stuff and, and whatever else in that, in that zone. So I got to do some quote unquote fun espionage and hard espionage and, uh, and some, you know, super spy, you know, aspects. So I kind of felt across the gamut of, of the shield Nick Fury experience. You know, I got to play with a little bit of all of them. Oh, that's still what we have to do sometime. Well, if uh, just get Dan, if we can get Dan twice a, in twice in one month, do a uh, James Bond episode. Oh yeah, we were thinking about that. Yeah. You yeah. guys do a James Bond podcast? No, but we were just saying we might have to do one episode where we have oh, you want to talk James Bond. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Bond. Bond is uh, yeah, it's a. That's I, a crazy I, universe. Yeah, I was such a super fan for the longest, longest time, and uh, and yeah, you know, you just can only occupy your neurons with so many things. Um, I don't. Um, now it's but, all 3D printed. Yeah, now <laughs> it's <drones>. not. 
I somebody sent me a video of some woman who looks like she used the same model I did, and it was just you know she just put me to shame. You know, like with that terrible cowl, like she just she just I mean she had like I don't know vacuum form fabricators and all this other kind of stuff. She really clearly knew exactly what she was doing. I think she got to print it out in one piece and not have to assemble it like I did. But you get um, there. You get there. Yeah. And I, the thing was, I had it at Terrificon. I think I'm going to, if I can figure out a way to pack it for uh, Austin for GalaxyCon, you know, I want to bring it as well because um, it's a nice little prop to sort of occupy the table. But um, I thought more people would like respond to it. You, you know, it's there. It's on. It's sitting on the table. They've got like this cool little Daredevil stand that it sits on. And I thought more people would like at least acknowledge it. But there were really only two people who even no, really noted it and asked to sort of wear it. Like one was a little kid and, and uh, you know, the other was uh, James Enstall who runs a, a podcast a radio show called, you know, geek to me radio. And, uh, and, but I just sort of thought more people would say, Oh, what is that? Or can I try that on? But who knows, maybe in Austin. That'd be me. Yes. Uh, I'd be trying on, but yeah, again, yeah. Let's say shout that out. Yeah. Austin, uh, Labor Day weekend. So. Yes. Yes. If you're, if you're insane enough to travel on Labor Day weekend, which I did not realize it was Labor Day weekend when I said, sure. Um, <laughs> I will be in Austin at galaxy con, which I believe is at the Austin convention center. Um, uh, Labor Day weekend. So, uh, September one, two, and three. Uh, so please drop in. There are long days. I believe it goes from like till eight o'clock or something, at least Friday and Saturday. Um, so plenty of time to come by and say hi and uh, and see some terrible black armor art before anybody else sees it and uh, and talk and chat and all that good stuff. And then, like I said, I guess we have our homework. Well, homework for next time. But yes, uh, we'll go live next episode. So yeah, kids. Okay. If you, yeah. If very you have cool. any questions, you can listen to Dan uh, explain the uh, Kickstarter live. Uh, you know, and in folks. the meantime, if folks want to go to axelsinfernal.com A-X-L-E-S-I-N-F-E-R-N-A-L I did it right, dot com. That's the preview site. That's not the Kickstarter site. But um, you get a little flavor of what this book is about. And there's also a sign up uh, you know, email list if you want to put your name on there and you want to be among the first to know when the Kickstarter is ready to kind of go. But you'll learn much more about that on our next Chichester Chats. Sounds yeah. like a promo. All right, I'll put, I'll put, yeah, well, it's better be. Yeah, I'll put that, I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, yeah, I, again, just follow this man on social media. I mean, you know, you'll see the previews for Axel's Infernal, Daredevil Black Armor. Yep. Teasing that, teasing that script every time. <laughs> <laughs> more than the script will be teased soon october 22nd because the book comes out november 22nd so october 22nd you can expect a deluge of uh, of black armor stuff all right so oh and uh <clears throat> the newsletter should we uh newsletter, newsletter please again? check out the newsletter storymaze.substack.com i think that's enough promos don't go beyond three that's it's socially accepted um <laughs> you know sort of behavior don't 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 overstay your welcome or over promote your whatevers but uh but thank you guys as always this is fun this one kind of went a little bit further afield than poor poor nick fury but uh i think we covered some interesting ground again i i just always like to get in the head of dg chichester plus you have a lot more you have so much going on it's like let's let's shout yeah. it out it's uh you know if it uh better better do it i figured i could either spread it out over the last you know 20 odd years or just cram it, you know, as much as possible in the next three to five months, you know. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you guys. Enjoy your weekend. I hope it's fabulous. I uh, hope the weather holds up wherever you guys are at and, uh, and have a good time. Right back at you. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye. Bye.